coming up next. Stay tuned to learn more about the state of the art in blockchain and cryptocurrency technology. Reimagine 2020. Hey guys, I'm Larry Pang from IOTEX, Head of Business Development, and I'm here to reimagine 2020. Hey everybody, it's uh, Patrick McLean again, one of your hosts for Reimagine 2020. Um, we've got our next speaker here, and, and this is a place uh, uh, I was just chatting with Larry about. Uh, it's kind of hits close to home. You know, I, I've worked in IoT and sensors and RFID. Uh, for many years, so it's something I'm kind of a little bit of a nerd about, so uh, this will be a fun one for me. Uh, but yeah, I want to introduce Larry and kind of get a bit of his background before we, uh, before we get into this conversation about, you know, how do blockchain and IoT mix and, and, and why is that relevant? But before I butcher any more of it, Larry, uh, introduce yourself and uh, maybe tell people a little bit how you kind of came to blockchain. Yeah, sounds good. Hey guys, I'm Larry, uh, born and raised in Los Angeles. Uh, I went to school at MIT on the East Coast. Uh, spent about five years in management consulting before jumping down the rabbit hole and joining IOTEX about two years ago. Um, I got into blockchain, you know, uh, I was doing a consulting project actually for the World Economic Forum during my consulting time. And we were doing a project about uh, financial inclusion in, in payments globally. And of course, Bitcoin came up, but also other things like, you know, M-Pesa, which is a peer-to-peer -peer payments via cell phones in Kenya. And that really sparked something in me that uh, I started to understand that the world doesn't have to work the way it does, right? You can see in Kenya, people leapfrogged the entire banking system and went directly to mobile payments. So once I started to think about that in the context, especially of our smart devices and, you know, how all that data is being kind of consolidated in these giant vertically integrated uh, corporations, uh, I thought we could do something better. So, you know, for the past two years, I've really been focused on reimagining uh, the Internet of Things in the context of blockchain. Awesome. I love that you mentioned that. I, I lived for many years like in t Tanzania between there and Kenya. So I was there mm -hmm. maybe 10 years ago, right, where I'm watching people with, you know, Nokia N9, not smartphones, right? They're getting little scratch cards from M-Pesa, entering their phone and, and sending money to people, right? So I think it's always a good lesson to reflect back on when we think first world countries are so advanced that some of these problems mm -hmm. we're trying to solve have, have actually, you know, been, been people have been working to tackle them for a while. Um, but hey, can you tell the audience, people that might not know, or, or maybe they know a little bit about it, uh, can, you, can you just in a nutshell give a, you know, your concise summary of I mean, what, is, what is IOTEX? Yeah, so IOTEX, at the core of what we do, we're a technology platform. We're a, a blockchain network, uh, but we really focus specifically on the intersection of blockchain, IOT, and privacy. And you know, IOT is an acronym, obviously, for Internet of Things, but you know, maybe that's not as uh, known to people. So just to give you a quick background on what Internet of Things is, right? Imagine all of these smart devices that you have uh, in your homes and your businesses. You know, right now, the world's being flooded with these security cameras, these virtual, virtual assistant cameras, uh, speakers, uh, your thermostats, even your toilets are going to be smart very, very soon, right? So the Internet of Things is the composition of all of these internet connected devices all around the world that are gathering data, you know, for to enhance our daily lives, enhance our business processes. But, you know, one thing that everyone should know about the Internet of Things is it's controlled by these gatekeepers that, you know, have uh, long been, um, you know, offering us digital services, you know, the Apples, the Googles, the Facebooks, uh, the Amazons of the world. But now they're really starting to get into um, our, our homes, right? They're starting to, uh, you know, purchase companies like Fitbit to get our health data, uh, Ring and Nest to get our home data and things like that. So in the, when it comes to our smart devices, you know, we really need trust and security and also privacy. So, you know, IOTEX takes that to heart and we're building a platform that allows people to build trusted devices that generate trusted data. And we hand that off to developers so they, they can build trusted applications. Um, you know, we'll dive into some of the more specific types of devices and applications that IOTEX is powering, but we believe in a human-centered future where you know, we, you can look at your devices 
and without a doubt know that you know this device is only doing what I expect it to do, right? There's no behind the scenes data sales. Uh, maybe you know a lot of people don't necessarily care about privacy today in the digital world because you know these things are not as tangible uh, as you know the, the video camera footage from your home, right? So when it comes to the physical world, you know we believe in a next generation of uh, security and privacy, and that's what we're trying to do with IOTEX. Got it. So, you know, I, I think for the average listener, you know, maybe even more advanced, uh, I think IOT kind of ends up with this general categorization, right? And, and, and technical people might understand it, right? Uh, the average consumer might just understand the product. But, but how do you guys kind of define IOT? And, and what do you think maybe some of the core blocks of that? So do you look at it as you know, thermostats and kind of home equipment are one subset or that maybe there's uh, chips or RFID tags on products identifying them. Like what, what are those kind of subsets of IOT? Yeah. So, you know, there's, I think there's a couple of ways to think about the internet of things, right? One is from the, the vertical standpoint that you were talking about. There's a lot of different industries, right? Think about all the industries that use smart devices today. Um, you know, everything from agriculture to smart homes, to smart cities, to, you know, autonomous vehicles, these are all kind of verticals in which, you know, IOT devices uh, are implemented, right? But if you think about it from a horizontal perspective, right, let's break down what uh, every device has, right? It has some sensors to gather data, you know, whether it's light, temperature, humidity, uh, different readings that, you know, these sensors grab. They have some type of storage and processing in a CPU, and they have something to connect to the internet, right? Whether it's directly to Wi-Fi, or it's, you know, some of these other connectivity modules like Bluetooth or, you know, low power, long range. Uh, there's a whole plethora of, uh, of options there. But, you know, you kind of mix and match these things, uh, different levels uh, and sophistications of hardware to really get different types of IoT devices, right? So we think about it from more of the horizontal perspective, right? What is the common denominator across all of these IoT industries? And that's kind of the need to understand that the, the inner workings of these, these devices are doing exactly uh, what they're meant to do. And they're rooted in trust and security and privacy, right? One of the big problems in IoT today is you don't necessarily own the devices or the data that are coming from them, right? But you're starting to see them uh, pop up in your homes. So we wanna give people full control of their devices and their data. And that's something that's not guaranteed by regulations or policies, is guaranteed at the technological level. And, you know, I think it's great, you know, I, I don't like making these analogies to the Bitcoin of IoT, but it's, it's very true, right? What we're doing to decentralize the financial system with Bitcoin and more peer-to-peer -peer payments, you're starting to see that translate to the IoT side too. So it's going to be you know, more peer-to-peer -peer exchanges of data. You don't need these centralized uh, counterparties to, you know, hold all your data in the cloud and, you know, do funny, funky stuff with it. So I think now is a great time to really consider um, you know, what devices you, you utilize in your daily lives, whether it's a, your Apple Watch or um, even your laptop and your phones, right? There's a whole level of security and privacy that we really, really need to acknowledge here. A lot of good points. Um, I want to dig in a little bit deeper into kind of the use cases because I think that's important. Uh, you know, I, I really do. I've always believed that one of the things IoT, it's kind of, it's a lot of a little bit too generally and, and people kind of need to dive in a bit. Um, you know, when I think about it, or one of the things in blockchain I always see is, okay, outside of the financial applications, when you look at things like supply chain, right? Or mm -hmm. I'll build, I'll, I'll, we'll deal with a corporate innovation partner uh, from our side and, and we'll hear, you know, they want to apply supply chain. And you kind of have all of these elements of trust, right? Where it's like, okay, uh, some lab is signing this paper. Okay, maybe they could sign it with a digital signature. Well, that just because somebody's signing it with a digital signature doesn't mean that it's accurate, right? So we're, mm -hmm. when I look at it, at least, and I want to get your insight, like in, I think a good example is supply chain. Let's say that a uh, product A to B, some, some uh, pharmaceutical drug needs to be kept at a certain temperature. So rather than someone signing and saying it was kept at the temperature, there's a sensor that's actually validating that, right? So that might be an example of a closed loop where uh, between this sensor and the blockchain, we get even closer to that data being, uh, you know, intemperable. But mm -hmm. You know, when you think about, uh, you know, concepts in IoT and blockchain and hard concepts to really distill it down to the user, what are those like one or two really killer applications um, that you think will, will kind of help fuel the IoT blockchain uh, uh, marriage? 
Yeah, I think, you know, it's all centered around trust, right? But let's make that more tangible. I think in the context of supply chain, as you're mentioning, right? Um, let's think about any kind of transaction between two parties that don't necessarily trust each other, right? This, this fuels the entire world. And there's always someone in the middle, an intermediary, that will establish that trust, right? Whether it's a bank or it's an insurance company that settles disputes between two parties, uh, both people tr trust this central party, and that's what facilitates the ability for them to resolve their issues, right? So if you think about it in the context of supply chain, uh, what you need is one single tamper-proof entity that can tell the entire uh, group of participants uh, the truth, right? And you know, a lot of people use humans as a proxy for this, but you know, one thing that is really interesting is you can use a tamper-proof device uh, as this kind of uh, source of truth, right? And you know, this is already happening today. I think the comp what we focus on at IOTEX here is kind of combining this concept of tamper-proof hardware with the concept of a tamper-proof backend that is blockchain, right? Tamper-proof hardware in this sense uh, is something that you use already every single day. You just may not realize it, right? The credit card, the chip on your credit card, that's a piece of secure hardware. Um, the, the, the chip in your phone that manages your face ID and your biometrics and make sure that never leaks outside of your phone, that's a piece of secure hardware. These things are called secure enclaves. Other words are trusted execution environments, but you should know these are just secure elements that really guarantee the integrity and confidentiality of all the data and processes that are kind of run inside of these things, right? So, you know, for example, one device that we have uh, built in partnership with Nordic Semiconductor actually is called Pebble Tracker. It combines this concept of uh, secure hardware, uh, basically uh, using a trusted execution environment developed by ARM to make sure that all the data that's captured by this device, whether it's GPS location, temperature, humidity, pressure, ambient lights, motion vibration, you know, we've jammed a lot of sensors into this device and it's a great prototyping kit. But the most important thing is every reading that comes from the device is signed and verified inside of that trusted execution environment. So it's verifiable by everybody, it's trusted, right? So you're kind of replacing the, the role of a human intermediary with devices. And this is gonna, this is gonna form the entire future, right? We daydream about you know, the, the Jetsons type of world where there's a lot of you know, machines talking to humans and robots becoming our butlers. But before we get there, we have to trust that all these devices are doing what we tell them to do or what they're programmed to do. And you know, that, that's a really important part of where blockchain comes into play too. Got it. So let's talk about that board for, for a second. It's the, mm -hmm. the IOTEX Pebble Tracker. Um, I'm, I'm looking at it as we're talking. I looked at it a little bit before, but it, it seems like it's a system on a chip. I mean, you could call it a, it, it's not, it doesn't seem Raspberry Pi-ish, more like an Adafruit type board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's basically like, a, it's, it's basically like, um, you know, an AirPods sized uh, tracker. Um, this is not it. These are AirPods. Uh, but basically, we, we built this um, specifically as a prototyping kit, right? We get a lot of interest from enterprises that are looking into asset tracking, right? Um, you know, one, one great uh, saying that I always hear about, you know, um, why it's needed to use secure hardware blockchain. You know, we don't recommend every use case to use blockchain and secure hardware. But, you know, if you're going to the grocery store, uh, you're probably going to take a normal car, right? But if you're transporting, you know, uh, 10,000 pounds of gold, then you're going to probably use an armored car uh, and that's our armored truck. And that's exactly what blockchain and secure hardware is. It's extra assurance for the things that really matter, right? So whatever asset you're tracking, whether it's, you know, 10,000 pounds of gold or, you know, it's, it's, your, it's your loved ones, right? You want to put a tracker that is not only privacy preserving, but is also fully trusted, right? It's tamper proof. Um, but basically this board is something that we've developed directly uh, using open source technologies. There's concept of open source hardware today that we're really into. Um, you know, basically, if you look at all of the, the, the devices out there, you may have heard the term jailbreaking before, right? You jailbreak your iPhone so you can use it with any service provider uh, that you want. But the reason why you need to jailbreak it is because all of this hardware is closed, it's proprietary. You can't leverage their trusted execution environments to run, you know, special trusted applications within them. So what we've done with this uh, Pebble Tracker is we've opened up that uh, trusted execution environment to be programmed, right? You can run your own processes within this 
and is really bringing the open source software um, kind of mentality and the ability to innovate very quickly and applying it to the hardware level. And also at the simultaneously kind of blending uh, the hardware and the software together at the same time, it really presents, you know, I always say that tamper-proof hardware plus tamper-proof blockchain gives you end-to-end -end trust. And it's something that uh, is very valuable, especially to remove the friction points and uh, kind of reestablishing trust at multiple steps, you know, within supply chain or even within our daily lives. Got it. And, and, and um, I want to kind of pivot here in a minute, uh, but, but I want to stick on this board for a second because I, I think there's a, maybe a few interesting elements in the conversation, which are, you know, for everybody that doesn't understand, imagine this board, like you said, it's, you know, about the size of AirPods. It's essentially what you call, I think, a system on a chip, right? Uh, it might be a slightly different acronym. You know, you, you have an entire op operating system running from it, et cetera. Uh, you're going to write code. You're going to write code very efficiently because this board won't hold a lot, but it's going to do what it does really well. And then I'm assuming, um, well, it looks like on this board, you guys have uh, GPS connectivity, cellular mm -hmm. connectivity, so that this board knows where it's at. It can talk to networks securely. And then I think on, on these types of boards, again, for you know, anybody in like the DI, you know, do it yourself community or hacker community has maybe played with them. Again, they're, you know, I think you could, in the abstract, look at this as a Raspberry Pi or something like that. But on that board, there, there's then inputs and outputs that people can connect different sensors, for example. Right. So, you know, this comes stock with a lot of uh, sensors, right? So it comes with GPS location. It comes with a, a Bosch environment sensor, which does temperature, humidity, air pressure, um, and, and gas. And it also does motion and vibration using a six axis gyroscope. And also it has a light sensor, right? So if you think about what all these metrics mean, right? GPS location is something that's very simple to understand, right? And, and that's, and not to interrupt you, but th that's what I like to tie together for everyone. So like, give them an example, mm -hmm. like, and let's say there's a student, right? A student's like, okay, maybe I want to get this board and, and hack on it for a weekend. You know, yeah. give them an example of some things they could build or like really cool applications you guys have seen. Yeah, so let's just mix and match some of these metrics together, right? So uh, one thing that people are already building with the GPS location thing, there's a project called HyperAware. There's a group out in London, actually a group of university students led by some great tech leads called London, Block London Blockchain Labs. And they basically use Pebble trackers and this trusted GPS data to inform when tolls should be collected on vehicles. So they basically mapped out kind of geospatial zones, polygons on a map. And anytime a vehicle enters or exits, uh, based on that trusted GPS data, they'll charge a toll instead of having to take a picture of the license plate when you enter and exit. So that's something tangible. But let's think of something else, right? Um, I talked about you know light and uh, humidity um, and temperature, right? So let's combine those three things. Going back to the supply chain case, right? What light tells you if you put a, pa a pebble tracker in a package uh, and you open it, that means the light sensor will catch uh, a difference in in uh, in light, which means your package is open, right? Um, sometimes you think about you know how all the fish in the world get shipped across the world today, right? They're not shipping in cardboard Amazon boxes. They're shipping in cold freezers that have to be held below zero degrees. Um, there was a crazy statistic I, I heard that, you know, I think it's 1.6 trillion tons of food uh, or tri $1.6 trillion of food, sorry, is wasted every single year just due to, you know, poor infrastructure and lack of ability to, to track, you know, these types of metrics. So if you know the temperature of your food, you can guarantee that, you know, vaccines or fish or other perishable goods are never um, perished, right? Um, and that can really protect uh, a, lot of, a lot of people. Um, so when you start to think about, you know, it's not just like a temperature reading, but what we really want to provide to people is we want to give people this data and allow people to write their own business logic on top of it, right? There's a concept in, in uh, kind of the enterprise space called the service level agreement, right? It's I, I'm offering you a service and I'm going to guarantee that I deliver that service uh, to um, to the sophistication that I tell you, right? So if I have a service level agreement that says I'm going to keep this, this fish that's being shipped from Japan um, under zero degrees, then, you know, without trusted data, then I have no ability to really tell, right? Um, so that's really something that I think is quite interesting with Pebble Tracker. It's getting people the ability to 
pr program kind of trusted interactions between parties without the need for an intermediary. All that you have to rely on is uh, the source of truth that both people trust and it's this tamper-proof device. Got it. So do you guys kind of look at that board as like a development board for somebody to kind of get onboarded to your platform and, and start playing with it? It is a development board because, you know, in, in, in the real world, right, uh, enterprises um, and anyone, you know, they, they have uh, the need to minimize their costs, right? Um, all these different metrics that we've jammed into this, or sorry, all these different sensors that we jammed into this device are not needed in production. There's not many use cases out there that would need every single one of those sensors, right? But what this allows people to do is grab, it's kind of like an all-in-one jack-of-all-trades device that can do anything um, that has to do with those metrics, right? Maybe in the real world, you'll have a, a tracker that only has the two metrics you need. Maybe it's GPS location and temperature. And that's all you need to fulfill a lot of these perishable goods use cases, maybe a light sensor as well. But air pressure, humidity, gas, you know, those are things that maybe, you know, will be deployed in the middle of a forest somewhere so that you can uh, detect forest fires earlier, right? So it's really about finding the specific use case that um, your device was, the device devices will apply to. You know, we're really great at doing this in the software world, but in the hardware world, you know, there's a need to kind of fit the hardware to the use case as well. Um, you know, we're already in discussions with some companies that are interested in developing their own types of versions of Pebble Tracker. And the feedback we got is, you know, the things that are important to them are, you know, of course, trusted data is great, but the secondary request is all about battery life, right? You know, there's a lot of sensors out there that, um, you know, there's some types of sensors that will be streaming data 24 seven. A video camera is a great example of that. Um, but there's also sensors out there that will turn on literally once a month, grab a piece of data, transmit it and go back to sleep. And these things can run on battery for up to 20 years, right? So it's really about the use case, right? It's, you know, do you need that second by second transparency of the environment of this asset? Or do you just need, you know, you're collecting uh, data points throughout a very, very long period of time. Um, so I think fit for purpose, but this board really allows you, this Pebble Tracker really allows you to be uh, experimental and daydream about, you know, different ways that the world can work, going back to, you know, some of the, the things we talked about earlier. Well, we could probably talk about this for longer. I don't want to hijack too much of the call, you know, just around this part. There's a few other questions I want to get to. Um, and just to explain to maybe the audience watching right now, you know, for the few thousand students and kind of general blockchain enthusiasts, you know, I think what Larry is describing and why these boards are relevant is, you know, yeah, you, you could go and buy a bunch of parts, solder them together and hook them up and, and it doesn't work and it takes you two weeks and right, you end up wasting your time. Why these development boards are nice because it includes all the sensors, right? Now, this might not be the thing. Let's say that you come up with some great idea and you want to ship it. Um, you probably wouldn't ship this device, right? So you would then figure out, okay, I've used this sensor, this sensor, this sensor. Uh, then you would go to what they call like a PCB manufacturer and you'd give them some spec and they would print you out the exact final board you want, right? Mm -hmm. But these devices are really good for kind of inspiring use cases and, and validating use cases. Um, so the last question I have on this, uh, do you guys offer any kind of promotion or deal for like a university students or developers? Um, uh, on the board and you might not, I just genuinely curious. No, that's definitely what our plan is to do, right? Like th this is perfect for the at-home developer, the one that just wants to hack a weekend project. It can get even more sophisticated, right? We're part of this enterprise IOT alliance uh, that just focusing on end product development. And this is what they're using in, in their use cases as well, right? But you know, one thing I forgot to mention is the blockchain aspect of it, right? What does blockchain have to do with it? So this trusted data from this board is written directly to the blockchain. Um, and that's a very powerful concept. Let me take a little bit of time to explain, right? So if you know that data came from a trusted device and you know that it hasn't been changed after the fact, that's a very pure source of data that doesn't need any type of third party to come in and say, yeah, this is trusted. You can proceed with the next step in your workflow, right? So that's going back to this concept of tamper-proof hardware and tamper-proof blockchain. Uh, what we can do is really grab trusted data from the real world and, and drop it directly into a blockchain smart contract that can then kind of automate 
and do exactly what it's told there, right? So you're taking the physical, you're, you're instructing the physical world to do exactly what you want it to do in a trusted way. And you're, you're putting that into the digital world via blockchain where the D apps uh, are trusted and they do exactly what they're trying to do as well, right? It removes all of the ability for people to misuse your data, to manipulate your data. Um, and it's just a very end-to-end -end trusted type of ecosystem, right? Um, this may be more on the theoretical level. You know, we also do a lot of things with, uh, you know, hardware manufacturers. Um, for example, we have this camera, it's called UCAM, right? We basically, we worked with this security camera manufacturer called Tendis. Uh, they've sold millions of cameras to enterprise, to governments and consumers in the past, but they came looking, they came to us looking for a new feature and that's privacy, right? So what we're talking about with Pebble Tracker is on more of the theoretical side of the intersection of blockchain and IoT. But what Pebble Tracker is, is using blockchain for a very practical purpose today. And that's just to make sure that, you know, this UCAM is a fully private home security camera that allows anyone to own their own data. You know, IOTEX doesn't have the data. Tenvis doesn't have the data. Corporations sure as hell don't have the data. It's all owned by you. So, you know, this is something that is already, you know, in the hands of a, a lot of our community. We've been doing beta testing on it and it should be launching on Amazon as early as June. So, you know, I think um, what we're really starting to see, you know, IOTEX cross over into this world where uh, it's not just about, you know, talking about consensus mechanisms, or it's not just about talking about, you know, deep parts of the protocol. We're starting to see real use cases come out of it. Of course, it's important to optimize all the layers of consensus and the peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. And we've done a lot of focus on that throughout 2017 through 2019, but now we're really excited to really you know, unleash these types of things uh, to the world. Got it. So for all the students listening right now, I'm gonna, me and Larry are gonna talk later and we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna try to find a way uh, to, to make it as easy as possible for, for any student that's interested in developing on blockchain or has a smart idea between, you know, IOT and, and blockchain uh, specific applications, right? And these are the types of products that you wanna get your hand on that really allow you to kind of, you know, have a hackathon weekend with your friends, et cetera, right? And, and kind of rapidly innovate um, and, and kind of getting that, those little boards in your hands sometimes is, is, is the barrier, right? So uh, I would encourage anyone listening that's kind of, you know, a bit of a hobbyist, has a concept, wants to program on it, um, you know, to look at the products like IOTEX, you know, and, and, and see if that board makes sense, see if it kind of fits, uh, do the sensors there, can you make something, you know, in a weekend or a few weeks that, that kind of inspires you. Um, yeah, I mean, I well, just wanted to add one thing, you know, we're really excited to uh, work with Mousebelt on the Education Alliance, right? I think the university audience is exactly the target we want because, you know, you guys are so imaginative, you're so creative, and you guys love to hack together projects, right? So, you know, IOTEX has our own kind of developer grants program. We're really looking forward to working with Mousebelt to really, uh, you know, put these devices into the hands of students and um, really start to see, you know, what people can build with them. 100%. So you and I are going to work on that together. Um, sure. Hey, on the topic of hardware, just because I do think it's essential to this conversation, right? And, and uh, as mentioned earlier, you know, I've kind, of, I've kind of been in it around enough. And I, I know when you kind of get to enterprise companies, et cetera, when you start having to suggest to them to switch out their devices, right? Or you have to replace hardware, uh, you kind of start to hit roadblocks to adoption. Um, and, you know, I heard what you're saying in regards to the camera stuff. How are you guys viewing and, and what progress have you made on, you know, where are you, are you looking at other entire subsets of hardware that are already deployed at scale, either to consumers or enterprise level, where you guys are trying to either write integrations, SDKs, kind of do the heavy lifting for those integrations one time, where then a developer can come back and, and quickly build on top of, of the groundwork that you guys have laid. Uh, where, where are you guys' thoughts there? Yeah, you know, we, we would love to just retrofit all of the IoT devices in the world and make them run on IoTex, which would, you know, grant them extra security and extra privacy. But, you know, going back to the thing I was talking about, the need to jailbreak an iPhone, right? This is exactly what big tech does not want you to do. They don't want you to take their devices and be able to plug your own uh, operating systems into them because that's preventing them from selling more hardware, right? So once the once the hardware world becomes more open source you know imagine you have um you know a corporation in the middle right you have users on this side and users and devices on this side you have people that want to service those users and devices on this side right right now 
the corporations sit in the middle and decide who gets to service who and the fees and the, uh, the, the operating structures. And, you know, um, they have total control over their entire user and developer ecosystem, right? So by taking them out and disintermediating them, which is really the crux of what we're doing with blockchain as a whole and crypto as a whole, right? Then you can start to see, you know, these, these two sides really form organic relationships, right? If I need a, if I have a device and I want to kind of mix and match, you know, I want this storage and IPFS, I want this connectivity via something like NKN, I want, you know, this um, type of compute, uh, you know, just general from, you know, uh, uh, from, from blockchain infrastructure, you know, you can really start to see all these different kinds of services mix and match. Whereas, you know, another way to explain it is today the IoT is in these giant vertical tech stacks, right? Not only is all the data held within these stacks, but all the money, right? All the control, you know, basically what, uh, you know, these really big tech giants have done is they built on top of the open source web 1.0, which includes HTTP and TCP IP and all these open source protocols. They've built proprietary web 2.0 layers on top of that, that, you know, are worth trillions of dollars, right? But that, that's where it stops. You'll, ne you'll never see someone build a billion dollar business, let alone a trillion dollar business on top of Google, right? That's just not going to happen because they're driving all the value down to that layer two. So imagine that layer two, we crack it and all the money, all the data is then distributed out to everyone. And then you can start to imagine how to build trillion dollar businesses on top of that. But the, the, this starts with kind of taking back our data, taking back our identity as a prerequisite. You know, a lot of people associate owning your data with money, right? Um, that's not necessarily true. You know, there's a lot of things around free will and the ability to make our own decisions without, you know, corporate intervention. And that's what I think um, data ownership and privacy is really all about, especially when it comes to, you know, our I IoT devices. So just something, just some food for thought. Oh, 100%. I was having a conversation earlier with uh, Dr. Alex Kahana. He's chief medical officer at Consensus Health. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a really interesting conversation, you know, around the Fitbits, right? And, and kind of the evolution of if even like healthcare, you know, how people are, you know, they're generating data, kind of feeding back into the system to make the system more efficient. Uh, but as that system becomes more efficient, how do they share in that efficiency, right? As these companies save money or cut their costs, you know, how do people start to generate wealth, right, on their own data, right? And rather than, you know, and I think you brought up the point earlier about Google and, you know, Google acquiring Fitbit. One of the interesting things there, I think, is not even to think of it so much as what happens into the future, but when Google acquired Fitbit, what they really acquired was past data, right, just on the front mm -hmm. end. They, they, now, now, even if you, you use the Fitbit five years ago, right? And while you're using that Fitbit, you might not have ever consented to giving Google your, your health data, right? But later on, uh, another action then changed that, right? So you might own, you might own your data might be saved today, but how does that stop, uh, you know, actions in the future from kind of restricting your privacy, right? And, and you're not going to get an email that says, Hey guys, we figured out this thing based on your health data, which saved us a ton of money. Uh, here's your share of it, right? So, yeah, um, I, I definitely, definitely think there's like some really interesting conversations there. We have about um, like six minutes, and and, and again, uh, I, I would love to have this conversation for longer. I think that maybe in the next week, as we uh, continue to push on this, uh, there's a few other interesting points. I think we'll reach out to you on. Um, but you know, one question I want to ask and, and get your opinion. Um, you know, obviously with MIT, very strong technical school. And a lot of students are watching this, right, and kind of help, trying to help them shape their thought, you know, as they're thinking about their careers or what they want to pursue. It could be data science, CS, you know, how kind of blockchain intersects with that or maybe IoT as well. Um, you know, we kind of see that there's not a ton of blockchain developers, right, and that's growing, right, as, as demand, I think, and as adoption grows. And then I, and what's really interesting, I think, about what you guys are doing is there's also not a ton of IoT developers. Like, I don't know that many people that can go into an ARM board at the lowest mm -hmm. level compiler, right? And, and you know, this is, it's pretty unique. And you make it easier with, with development devices like this board, et cetera, which is, is, is how you get adoption. But when you combine those two, how do you guys look at that? Where, you know, blockchain is a, is a little bit of a niche still. Uh, mm -hmm. IoT is still a little bit of a niche. How, how are you guys kind of thinking about that in regards to attracting and, and, and educating developers? 
Yeah, I think, you know, you hit it right on the head there. I think education is the biggest part of it, right? Um, you know, educating people not only about, you know, how to use platform that we've built, but also, you know, why it matters, right? I think that's something that uh, I personally try to revisit every few months. It's just like, um, you know, what am I doing now and why does it really matter, right? And again, not to say that, you know, innovating on consensus is not like the, uh, it's deeply important, but to, to bring this to mass market, you know, we have to do more, right? We have to think about, uh, there's a saying that uh, if you want to replace a product in your life, the replacement has to be 10 times better than the, the former or else no one's gonna make that decision to change their behavior, change their lifestyle to use this new alternative, right? Maybe we're only three times better right now. So how do we not only think about, you know, the decentralization aspect of it, but the user experience side of it, right? How do you think about uh, driving value back to users? And, you know, it's not just done through very complex, you know, mining incentive structures. This is done in the real world, right? So, you know, that was, that's what I recommend um, all the students out there to really think about is, you know, um, these are the tools I have. This, this is my toolkit, but what am I building and what is it for? You know, a lot of the times, you know, we get stuck in how do we make money uh, off of crypto and off of blockchain, but that will come. You know, I think when you build a product that people love and will change their behavior for, uh, it benefits them, it benefits society. The, 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 the kind of the, the monetary benefits will come. But I think, um, you know, starting with the ingoing assumption that I need to build something that makes this solution. I'm not just creating another way to do something this other way of doing something has to be great, right? It has to be much better than what we're doing today. And I think, you know, that's a fundamental principle we have here at IOTEX, right? Like it, it, in the IOT world, it's sometimes important to understand all the things that are going wrong in the IOT world before you propose a solution, right? Like I, I talk a lot about corporations, corporations, trust me, like I, I use their services. I think they've built, they've progressed the industry uh, farther than it could I could have ever ever imagined in the past decade right but now we're reaching a really big tipping point where you know you're starting to see uh, companies like Amazon Ring and the entire fiasco that they had with hackers kind of gaining access not through sophisticated hacks they're just walking through the front door with a uh, username password breaches right you're starting to see Zoom literally lie about uh, having full end-to-end -end encryption when they actually have client to server encryption you know these things are things that we can guarantee with technology. We don't have to rely on um, big tech to really facilitate these things. And I think the more that we as users demand it and the more we as innovators build alternatives, you're gonna start to see this really shift. So my message to all the builders out there is keep that in mind and you know, good things will come. Awesome. So, hey, we have about three minutes here and then uh, unfortunately I have to go to my next conversation, but it, uh, I, I want to, by the way, how much are those pebble boards? So right now, I mean, uh, of course you manufacture in volume, right? In, in the thousands, it'll become cheaper, but you know, we're trying to keep it around $50, right? Um, it, it comes so with can a, someone buy them today? Not yet. You know, we're still, uh, you know, like you said, there's when it comes to uh, hardware, right, there's a lot of low level code that we're still working on at the firmware level. Uh, but this is, I mean, the hardware is complete, but we're at the stage of making this usable for developers, right? Working on the firmware, we're working on the embedded software development kit uh, that will really allow people to, you know, plug and play this. Um, it, it's not fun writing low level C. No one, if for anyone that understands, like what he's saying, like low level code is, you don't have like, you can't just put a thousand lines of code and write it super inefficiently. Like each character you type matters. Like Exactly, you, yeah. You, like, like, you're, you're gonna be scratching your code to see if you can get rid of like one or two letters in certain yeah. circumstances. And We're trying that's to take that, that out of There's low system. power and low storage. This is the cost of keeping the device cost down. Exactly, um, yeah. When, the, when, yeah, those, no, when, those, when, the, when those are ready, when we can buy some, I'd like to buy maybe five or 10. I'll, I, that's for me, I'll send them out to some of the schools. Of course, uh, so let, of course, yeah. Let, let, let me know. Um, hey, so in our last minute or two here, um, I just, again, there's a lot of students listening to this, blockchain clubs, universities all over the world. What would your message to them be, you know, as a 19, 20, 21 year old student, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thinking about their career, how, how would you advise them if you could go or fast forward, go back in time, how would you be thinking about that? How would you be thinking about blockchain and what would your advice to them be? Yeah, you know, when I got out of college, right, um, 
I was lucky to have done a lot of great internships in finance, right? And through those internships, I tried a little bit of everything. I never really knew exactly what I wanted to do. And that's why I went into consulting, right? I think that consulting is the catch-all when you don't know what you want to do. But I'm so blessed to have done that, right? I think a lot of people jump in to situations where, um, you know, I think they don't necessarily see the, see the entire picture, right? Um, I think uh, being an entrepreneur is great, but finding mentors that can really guide you and show you what's happening in the real world and with the business world uh, is also very important, right? So um, I always say that, you know, when, whenever you're, you're, you're doing something, when you're doing a project, even going to school, you know, you may be taking some classes that may not be as relevant, but these are opportunities to learn how to learn, right? I think that's the most important thing that I've done in my life is just continuously uh, learn different ways to learn. And once you have that, um, build your own personal skill set. These things are, if you think about like the concept of compound interest in money, compounding your knowledge through learning different things and uh, aligning with different people that you really respect and you trust. Um, I think that's, that's the key, right? So don't worry too much about, you know, getting that, you know, amazing job offer out of college. You know, the world is changing, especially after COVID. I think, you know, you're going to see a lot of, you know, people starting businesses with zero marginal costs, right? Doing digital goods on the internet. So the world is your oyster. I think just keep that in mind. This is a long-term game. You know, um, I've been out of school for about eight, 10 years now. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a constant battle every day. So uh, keep, on, keep on trucking. You're still early in the process, but uh, the world is bright and it will be brighter because of your contributions. All the students listening, listen to Larry. I think you're going to want to take his advice. Um, you know, I, I, my final words would be, I, I, I have always been intrigued by IoT and blockchain. I hear so many applications of supply chain. People say they want to put art on the blockchain, right? And I kind of think of it and say, okay, how do you validate it, right? Are you going to put a QR code on it? Okay, well, I can mm -hmm. copy a QR code, right? So I think as we start to put physical items on the blockchain, we need a way to validate right, or, or interactions, et cetera. We need a way to validate that those interactions are real, right? And, and, I, and I don't know how else to get there other than a variety of IoT sensors, right? Whether these are ARM boards with a variety of input and output uh, options, uh, RFID sensors, your cell phone, low energy Bluetooth, et cetera, et cetera. So again, Larry, I really do wish we could continue this conversation. I have a few ideas maybe for what might be interesting the next week if you have time. Um, but, uh, before we head out, uh, any, any, any last word you want to say? We, we got, we have a little under a minute here. Yeah. You know, final words is, you know, we really enjoy working with Mousebelt and all they're doing. I think, you know, this initiative about bringing together like-minded people at, you know, this time in your lives where, you know, the, the college experience of really molding yourself, right? Like I came into college a completely different person than I came out. Of. So, um, you know, uh, we're looking forward to launching more initiatives and, you know, getting devices in, in your people's hands, right? I think the experience of holding and seeing a device that is on and you see the, the data in the dashboard, that, that really changes the experience for a lot of developers that we currently work with. So um, keep an open mind, even if you're not a huge blockchain and IoT fan, um, I think that uh, this is gonna be the future. Um, so yeah, much appreciated for the opportunity to chat and definitely check out IOTEX. Likewise, you guys will see all their other all their links below. Um, we got to run. Larry it was very nice talking with you again. Want to continue this conversation? Uh, everybody, make sure to, to check it out. And uh, we're going to be getting back to you here shortly with our next conversation. It was very nice talking with you, Larry. And uh, you have a great day. You too.